Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, a carcinoid cancer foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. If you don't know me, my name is Rain Bennett. I am your host. I will guide you through today's episode. And I'm a filmmaker and, and now virtual TV show, show host. <laughs> and I've been working with CCF for 10 years, folks. 10 years as a decade creating video content in, in one form or another, but always with the same mission in mind, and that is to, to spread awareness and to educate people about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we're here to do. And another benefit that the show adds, and I argue that the foundation really adds, is cult cultivating a community within the net community, which we all know is very, very strong. And that's one of my favorite things to, to, to see about this show is the community, is the conversations that we see uh, going in, in the comment section. And as I see some of you already doing, sharing where we're from. If you are new to the show, tell us where you're signing on from in the world. We have uh, Neuroendocrine Cancer UK. We have Canada in the house, people from all over the States. So tell us hello. Tell me what you're having for lunch. If you are at lunchtime, some of us, like today's guests, are probably in breakfast time, not <laughs> in lunchtime. Uh, so let us know where you are. Say hello. We're going to get the show started. But before we go, we always like to thank our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. We absolutely could not do this program without them. and We are grateful for their support. We also like to include this disclaimer from them, and that is that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at home, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts, and CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatment. So that last line is really the takeaway. We're going to give you some great advice today. We're going to hopefully answer some of your questions, hopefully a lot of your questions, but by no means do we or, or our guests know your specific case. So take those answers to your questions, take that advice back to your home team, which does know your specific case and make the best plan moving forward for you. As we all know, this case or this uh, disease is each case is unique and has its own unique path. Okay. So that's going to be really important. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Sukmani Pada. How are you, Dr. Pada? I'm good, Rain. Uh, thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here with you and uh, everyone in the audience. Right on. We're excited to have you. So for those uh, that aren't familiar with you, uh, tell us who you are, what you do. And, and as I like to put it, the, the role that you fill in the neuroendocrine tumor community. Yeah, delighted. Um, so I am a thoracic uh, medical oncologist. I'm currently uh, at Cedars sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. Um, I just got here about uh, five months ago and took on the role of director of thoracic medical oncology. Prior to that, I was at Stanford University, also in California. Uh, for the last 14 years, I did all of my training there and uh, also my first faculty position. So I think first I'll define what is a thoracic medical oncologist. Um, so I'm a doctor that specializes in medical treatments for any cancer that originates within the chest. So that includes, of course, uh, lung cancer, um, but it also includes more uncommon cancers that arise in the chest. So this includes lung neuroendocrine tumors. And I see the spectrum from carcinoid tumors, typical atypical carcinoid tumors of the lung, all the way to small cell and large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma of the lung. And the other um, uncommon cancer of the chest or thorax is thymic malignancies. So there are a variety of thymic malignancies or thymic cancers. And um, in fact, neuroendocrine tumors can also arise from the thymus gland. So that's, uh, uh, that's my overall clinical specialty. So part of my time is spent in the clinics, um, but I'm also a clinical researcher. Uh, participating in um, clinical trials of new therapeutics, novel combination therapeutics in these different cancers, and also working with our laboratory scientists uh, to see what translational work we can do to further guide treatment for our patients. Awesome, awesome, good to hear. So folks, 
That's really, I know every week we have questions about lung nets and we, and we usually field them. We've had other lung net specialists on here before. This is really going to be a unique opportunity for you to get some of those questions answered. Also, always a shout out to Cedar Sinai. We have had Dr. Alexandra Ganji, Dr. Andrew Hendafar. We have had uh, Cedar Sinai in the house. They are a friend of the foundation. <laughs> yes, they're an ma- amazing group of people. I know it's such a good team there. So I know that <laughs> you'll, uh, you, you're probably finding your, your way very well there. So so, um, yeah. Hi, Rain. Thank you for giving us hope. Well, absolutely. I appreciate the program that CCF has created it to allow that. Uh, hello from South Africa, Australia. So I told you, Dr. Powder, we have people nice. all, all over. Somebody even said, uh, oh, hello from Canada. Welcome, Suki Powder. Love you, Rain. And we love you back, Dorothy. Welcome, everybody. Mm-hmm. So go ahead and start sending in your questions. You know now the topics that you're really going to get the most benefit from. Uh, this is how Luncheon with the Experts go. We have a conversation. We answer questions. We get a lot of questions, folks, sometimes hundreds of questions. So inevitably, we won't, we won't get to them all. We want to. We try to. But we have this show every week, so you can always keep coming back for more. But just know, if we don't get to your question or if it creates a follow-up question, I really encourage you to reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation. You can message, message them privately here on their Facebook page. You can also reach them at their website, carcinoid.org. They will get you that information or get you the person who can get you that information, that is what they will do. And another option, you can always replay this video. It will live evergreen on the videos tab here on the Facebook page and all the other Luncheon with the Experts that we've had and many, many more videos, some of which I've helped CCF create, live on that. It is a huge resource for you, a huge bank of videos. But Luncheon with the Experts, folks, we've been doing this for over a year now. So we've got 50 some, maybe on our way to 60 episodes available for you. So a lot, a lot of content, an encyclopedia of content, if you will. So check those. Starting Monday, we republish each episode to YouTube for people that don't have Facebook. We have it available for them as well. But let's try to get as many people here as possible. I ask you all to do this every week. It's really helpful because even though you can replay this video, the real benefit is this interactive one-on-one session to get these questions across that you've been struggling with. So tag people in the comments, share the video to their page, text them, email them, Snapchat, whatever you got to do, get some people here so they can really get the benefit. And another ask that I always have of you all, and you do such a good job of this, I already mentioned that we get hundreds of questions, so we can inevitably in one hour can't get to them all. If you see a question in the comment section that you also have, or you're interested in the answer to, you can do a, do me a big favor, which helps me help you. And just, you can like that question or love it, or really any of the emojis that Facebook gives you the option to use. They all effectively work the same way for me. And what that does is upvotes that comment, that question. So I know there's a demand for it. So as I'm scrubbing through the questions, if I see seven or eight people like this question, okay, Rain, we really need to get this one across. So that helps me do my job, which is to serve you. So finally, before we get started, a question. Have you downloaded CCF's free Net can- Cancer Health Storylines app? This app is amazing. It makes it easy to record your symptoms, your, your medications, your moods, your nutritional concerns, all of that. So if you haven't, check that out. We will put a link into the comments. And that being said, if there's anything Dr. Pata mentions today, a resource, a, a, an article, a medication, anything like that, We're going to do our best to get a link to that in the comments as well so that you don't have to jump out of the live, open a Google, you know, Google window, search for it and try to find it. We'll try to do all that work for you. That is our job. All right. Send in your questions. Let's start the show. So, Dr. Pata, um, we talked a little bit earlier today about some of the overlap. You know, you don't really work with GI net patients, which obviously there are a lot of. And I was like, well, you know, certainly there's a, there's an overlap in, in some, of, you know, some of the topics that lung neuroendocrine tumor patients and GI net patients deal with. And we started talking about PRT. And I asked you, I was like, but PRT is not actually is not approved for lung nets uh, yet, right? And you said, yeah, no. So um, PRT is not yet approved for uh, lung uh, patients with lung nets. But um, I just received word yesterday that we have the green light for our clinical trial. It's going to be conducted in the U.S. through a clinical trial organization called Alliance, which is sponsored by the National C- Cancer Institute. And this trial is going to enroll patients who have uh, lung neuroendocrine tumors who are noted to have uh, somatostatin receptor positivity on their tumors. 
And the way that we are determining that is with PET scans that examine the level of uptake of the somatostatin receptor, which is commonly present on patients with, uh, who have lung neurodegen tumors, but also GI neurodegen tumors, pancreatic neurodegen tumors. So for uh, those uh, patients, um, this trial is a randomized study. Patients will be randomized to the standard course of PRT. Uh, we are using the uh, currently approved therapy in the U.S., lutetium 177 dotatate, uh, at least approved in uh, patients who have GI and uh, pancreatic neurodegenerative tumors versus the only uh, standard of care in uh, patients with lung neurodegenerative tumors, which is Everlinus. So we know that, of course, um, there are going to be uh, many patients who are interested in uh, enrolling on the study uh, to get access to the PRT arm. So we did acknowledge that in our trial design and actually crossover is built. So if a patient gets initially signed a treatment of Everlimus, and if that treatment eventually stops working, then patients will have the opportunity within the context of the trial uh, to get PRT. So we're very excited. Um, the, um, uh, both uh, Dr. Tom Hope at uh, UCSF, who's a nuclear medicine physician expert in PRT, uh, and myself, our co-principal investigators of the study that are, is going to be ongoing uh, very shortly. So um, hopefully I'll have a precise uh, date of activation. And then of course, uh, each individual uh, academic site or institution within the US will have their own activation timelines. But this is gonna be an exciting option for our patients uh, with lung neurodegenerative tumors. And we're also going to learn more about how effective uh, PRRT is uh, for our patients. So it's, it's a very important study for our patients. Absolutely. I mean, that's something that even I know, you know, I've talked to, to, to several specialists that has been desired uh, for, for a while. So I really hope that that can be kind of a, a game changer, hopefully, but I know people ask questions about that all the time. So good news, folks. Uh, I, Dr. Potter, I see a lot of great questions already coming in. So we're going to go ahead and start taking Wonderful. some questions from the audience. Uh, and I and I told you earlier they are very very well educated. So uh, <laughs> I hope you're ready to field them. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, of course you are. Of course you are. Okay. So uh, starting off, Lori and a few other people it seems has a question: Can a typical tumor turn aggressive? And uh, let's also can we just break down the the four times you know atypical and typical and just lay a little groundwork first and then take that question. Yeah, Lori, that's a, a that's a great question, and Rain, I also think it's a good idea to to <laughs> break down the naming here because the naming for uh, lung neurodegenerative tumors is different um, than for patients with GI or pancreatic neurodegenerative tumors. So generally, uh, what uh, we call well differentiated, or I say, tend to be more well behaved uh, neurodegenerative tumors of the lung are typical carcinoid and atypical carcinoid. In the more poorly differentiated category or maybe more poorly behaved uh, tumors of uh, lung origin, these are the small cell lung cancers and the large cell neurodegenerative carcinomas of the lung. And the way we make this distinction is working with our pathologists. Our pathologists are key here. Um, so there's a couple of criteria that the, they are looking at when they look at the tissue under the microscope. The first is, of course, simply describe what it looks like under the microscope, because there are features of typical and atypical carcinoid tumors of the lung that look very different um, from those of small cell and large cell neurodegenerative carcinoma. So that's just the first step. The second step is they want to understand within this tissue sample what um, proportion of the cells are growing or dividing. So they have a, um, a specific terminology for that called the mitotic count or the mitotic index, uh, which is able to define that. And so if they see a higher level of that, uh, that is uh, goes more in the... Uh, grade category of the small cell and large cell neurodegenerative carcinoma. If there's low levels or low mitotic count, then it goes within the uh, typical and atypical carcinoid range. Uh, so I'm always looking for that buzzword within the pathology report. 
The other thing that they look at is um, something called necrosis. So necrosis are areas of the tissue sample where there are a proportion of cancer cells that have died out, essentially because um, the hypothesis is that they are outgrowing their blood supply to some degree. So for more um, these uh, poorly differentiated cancers of small cell or large cell, we tend to see that uniformly and also more extensively. Um, for patients with typical carcinoids, we don't see that feature. Uh, for atypical carcinoid, uh, we may see um, focal areas of necrosis, but not extensive in the same way that we see for small cell or large cell. So those are the key criteria. Um, there is something also that's used for GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that we use more in lung neuroendocrine tumors as a supplement. So this is a KS67 value. It's getting at similarly what the mitotic uh, index or mitotic rate is, is also trying to get at, just a proportion of cells, how many cells are active here, how many cells are uh, dividing. So sometimes you'll also see that in the pathology report, but it's not one of our core criteria. So with regards to the question, Lori, that you answered about, is there um, sort of, can there be transformation from typical carcinoid to atypical carcinoid to small cell lung cancer? Uh, I can tell you I've not seen described um, a transformation from a carcinoid tumor to a small cell or large cell neurodegrin cancer. But between typical and atypical carcinoid, where the categories sit closer together in terms of their similarities, um, this has been described. And I have also personally seen it within the clinics. And they talk about it a lot, tumor boards, as it relates to even patients who have had GI neurodegrin tumors or pancreatic neurodegrin tumors, where the biology uh, can change over time. I haven't seen it go from you know, very low grade to super high grade aggressive, uh, but you can see the biology change over time. And that's not an infrequent under the pressure of uh, treatment uh, for, for cancers in, in general, the biology can change under the pressure of treatment. So I hope that answers your question, Lori. Awesome, thanks. And thanks, Lori, for a great question to kick us off. Um, moving on, we have a question from Kate after PRRT. Do us lung patients uh, remain, maybe that's U.S. lung patients, uh, remain on lanreotide, no carcinoid syndrome, and what markers do you use? Did you follow that? Yeah, so um, that's, that's a great question, Kate. So for um, generally for use of uh, somatostatin analogs like octreotide or lanreotide for patients with lung uh, neurodegrin tumors, we are using it in two capacities. So one is if um, a patient has evidence of excess serotonin secretion, which results in carcinoid syndrome, uh, symptoms of which frequently include flushing and diarrhea. And so we use some outstanding analogs like octreotide and lamreotide within this scenario to help control those symptoms. Now, what's interesting um, for patients with lung neurodegrin tumors, it's less common to have some of these functional syndromes like carcinoid syndrome. What we know from sort of database studies, uh, epidemiologic studies, the rate seems somewhere to be 10 to 15%. So um, we are using some abstantin analogs in this indication in the minority of the time for our patients with lung neurodegrin tumors. So that's one thing. Uh, with uh, the, the second role where um, octreotide or lanreotide may have a role is for cancer control. So we borrow, um, again, we have to borrow sometimes from the literature in GI neurodegrin tumors and pancreatic neurodegrin tumors because there's never been uh, data from a prospective randomized trial of somatostatin analogs in um, patients with lung neurodegrin tumors. It seems like that would be a very basic question. It was uh, attempted. Uh, there was a trial with lanreotide uh, that was uh, open when I was at Stanford, but we had a very challenging time 
accruing patients to that uh, study. So, and I, I think that was also seen uh, sort of in the accrual across institutions. So we don't have that robust level one evidence from a trial like that, uh, but we do use it uh, for cancer control. So generally, um, if uh, the tumor has uh, progresses on octreotide or lanreotide, meaning uh, existing lesions are growing or new areas of tumor have shown up, um, we often switch therapies. We, there's just lack of data. Is there benefit to continuing the octreotide or lanreotide at that time point? We just don't have that data. So I generally tend to switch the treatment in order to avoid any overlapping uh, toxicities of combine, combining treatments. Got it, got it. Thanks for your question, Kate. Folks, if you are just joining us or joining us late, this is Lunch with the Experts. We are here today with our guest, Dr. Sukumani Pada from Cedar sinai uh, And listen, I know that we have all different kinds of people in the, in the um, audience today and every week. We have doctors, we have support group leaders, caregivers, and probably uh, the, the biggest uh, group are patients. So if you are a patient, I wanna see how many of you are out there. Just type zebra in the comments. Let us know <laughs> that you are here and that you are uh, part of the NET community. Uh, let's keep moving on. We've got great questions. I already see them lined up, so we're gonna keep moving on. Karen says, can you talk about emerging treatments for receptor negative metastatic lung NETs? Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a great question, Karen. Um, so receptor negative uh, lung neuroendocrine tumors are a little bit more uh, challenging because um, you know when we're thinking about off-label treatments like uh, PRT, lutetium-177 uh, dotatate, that's not a good treatment op option for patients who are lacking that um, biomarker. Because many of the trials also done with octreotide and lanreotide um, were done in GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, before the era of the uh, SSTR, somatostatin receptor PET scan, uh, we don't know if we require that biomarker also for use of octreotide or lanreotide for these uh, group of, of patients. One would hypothesize that maybe they wouldn't work as well if that uh, biomarker was not present on a PET scan, but we actually don't know with 100% certainty. So um, for SSTR negative or somatostatin receptor negative um, lung neuroendocrine tumors, we do have the targeted therapy uh, available of everolimus. So everolimus uh, hits um, often abnormal pathway, not only within lung neuroendocrine tumors, but also other types of um, cancers known as mTOR. And so that is a therapy that we do have uh, available for, for use in uh, SSTR negative lung nuts. Uh, the other therapy that I found can be very helpful is uh, a combination uh, chemotherapy of uh, cape cytobine and temozolomide. There is actually quite good data for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors where this treatment works quite well in controlling cancer. And there's also cohort studies that have been done within uh, lung neuroendocrine tumors, kind of single institutions looking back at their own experience where uh, there has been activity demonstrated with this uh, particular combination. And in my own experience, um, I've also seen it uh, be able to control cancers and in about 20% of patients, the, the cancers will actually you'll see some evidence of, of shrinkage with this uh, chemotherapy. But really in terms of novel therapeutics, this is where we need to uh, bridge with our laboratory scientists to see, are there interesting biomarkers or pathways within SSTR negative uh, lung nuts that would be good for exploitation for therapy um, because you're exactly right. We need to have uh, more therapeutics available here. So thank you for your question, Karen. Absolutely. Appreciate you, Karen. Next question from Ursula, our friend from South Africa. Um, let's see, having a fourth round of PORT treatment on September 8th, uh, large tumors on my liver and pancreas. 
Uh, is it safe to have five, maybe six rounds? I'm feeling really good on this treatment compared to chemotherapy. Oh, well, Ursula, I'm glad you're, um, it's a tolerating treatment well, so that's fantastic. So the, the standard of care is um, four rounds of PRT for the first course. Now, there is a lot of discussion if um, the tumors respond very well or the cancer is controlled for a prolonged period, can we retreat? So this is probably one of the most common questions that uh, we talk about <laughs> in our yeah. uh, consumer board, not only when I was at Cedars, but also when I was at uh, Stanford. So I think uh, we all are also having those uh, similar questions. So with regards, generally what happens is patients will get the standard uh, four uh, cycles, and then uh, we examine how the disease uh, goes over time. And then there's different thresholds where, um, of, of comfort where you could say retreat with PRT. Uh, the magic number that we always talk about within uh, the tumor board is sort of the 18 month mark. If the tumor has been controlled for 18 months after a course of PRT, one could consider again using another course. Of course, at that time, you want to um, re examine like, the blood counts, the kidney function, make sure that the patient is uh, feeling well, and then, of course, uh, ensure that the biomarker uh, from the somatostatin receptor PET is still uh, present to a degree where you think that PRT is the best, best option at that time. So, you know, those discussions, if, if possible, should be had with um, the nuclear medicine physician who uh, really is in charge of uh, delivering uh, PRT. The other thing uh, that uh, we are trying to examine within our uh, study, uh, the study I mentioned that we're going to do a PRT in patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors, is a concept called dosimetry. You know, is there a way to measure the dose that was delivered to tumors? Because one can imagine that there may be slight differences in the uptake of dose among tumors, and can we then tailor the dose of PRT? So that's also an emerging uh, question regarding this field of dosimetry, regarding a retreatment of uh, PRT. And right now we just don't have um, high level data to guide us. So in that situation, as, as much as possible, we try to discuss among the uh, experts to see, you know, is this a good idea at this time? Is this the best option we have for our patient in front of us? So thanks for your uh, question, Ursula. Thanks. Absolutely. Appreciate you being here. Um, next question from Cindy. I see a thoracic surgeon annually to monitor my lung carcinoids. Should I be seeing any other doctor for these tumors? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so oftentimes that is true when um, a lung carcinoid tumor is uh, caught early. Uh, the definitive treatment is with a surgical uh, resection. So the scenario that you're currently in uh, being followed by thoracic surgeons, if all the tumor required was a surgery, uh, is, is uh, quite, quite common. Um, I do, uh, as a medical oncologist, I'm always happy to uh, see those patients just to make sure there's nothing else that I see. Uh, preoperative staging, like all the imaging we got was absolutely what we should have got, that the pathology details are to my satisfaction. Um, and also, um, you know, taking a good family history to ensure that we're not concerned about any inherited um, genetic syndrome that may have uh, caused the lung neurodegenerative tumor. Now, again, that's pretty uncommon for patients with lung neurodegenerative tumors, only about 5% uh, are associated with an inherited syndrome known as MEN1. Um, but those are the kinds of things um, that I may uh, ask in addition if the surgeon hasn't, but the surgeon may have already. So that is a standard of care. After you've had a curative intent surgery, the pathology looked good, the resection was uh, had neg negative margins. We often follow with surveillance. This is also a question though, like, how frequently do you follow? How long do you follow? So it depends a little bit on the uh, characteristics that we're seeing in the tumor, how large was the tumor, 
Um, you know, well, how were there lymph nodes involved? What did, the, where were those lymph nodes located? We may tailor the surveillance uh, strategy accordingly. But usually what I'll do is um, at that first um, look after six months or a year after surgery, we'll take a look. If everything looks good, then we tend to do uh, annual uh, surveillance. And we know that although um, in a completely resected uh, lung carcinoid tumor, the prognosis is very good, um, that there are these uncommon recurrences uh, that occur late. So sometimes our surveillance is um, as long as up to a decade and how you do that, whether you're alternate, alternating with chest X-ray or CT, you know, these are all questions where we don't have specific data, but that's, that's what I generally do is, is annual surveillance for, for up to uh, 10 years. Got it. Got it. Thanks, Cindy. Um, folks, you know, this, we talk about this disease a lot and, and sometimes we need a little bit of levity with this, these conversations. So we have a question from Brian that says, fun question. Why don't we ever see you eating lunch when doing lunch with the experts? Well, Brian, like my mother told me, if I'm ever on stage to not put gum in my mouth to have it out before you go up on stage, it's very similar. You would not want me eating lunch and trying to talk or our guest. However, the luncheon is for you all. I have my trusty seltzer water in my coffee mug, and that is what I have. And then I'll have lunch afterwards. Uh, you wouldn't want me to be talking with food in my mouth, I promise. Uh, okay, so question from Barbara. And it's a it's a it's a, a little bit of a lengthy one, so so bear with me. Are you familiar with the recall of the Respironix CPAP machines due to the degradation of the noise abatement foam, resulting in the inhalation of foam particles with CPAP use, and how this is impacting people with lung nets? Could could this cause the appearance of lung nodules on the chest CT, and have a negative impact on the lungs? Barbara, that sounds like a very good question, but honestly, I don't, I don't know anything about that. Okay. So. Cool. Cause me neither. Okay. I, I thought it might've just been me. So uh, sorry, Barbara. And there, and there was a lot. Sorry. Too. I was, you know, was going to try to explain that. If there's a, a way to simplify that question or for us to still give you an answer, Barbara, you know that we want to, uh, but we will keep it moving for now because I certainly don't know the answer. Um, next question. How do you feel about uh, questions with imagery with scans? Let me try. Okay, Ron says, when performing a copper C CU-64, um, what is the difference between a PET scan as opposed to, uh, to using a PET scan as opposed to using an MRI? I had a CU-64 scan done using a PET. However, uh, I've heard Emory only uses MRI machines for C uh, CU-64 scans. Oh, I'm not familiar. Okay. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with, the, that, with the copper 64 scan? Or the, the PET versus MR. Yeah part of that question little, so. little 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 too uh too nuanced there all right we need a radiologist <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so we, we gave it a shot we gave it a shot Ron. um all right so joy back to back to uh lung nets and what is the this part of the lung net question what is the difference between patients with dip neck who have trachea lymph node involvement not just lung to tumor involvement and also what is one singular link that they might have found within dip neck patients. Yeah, <laughs> Joy, that's a that's a great question. So maybe I can just uh, start by describing what dip neck is for those in the audience who may not know know it. So dip neck is an acronym. It stands for diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia. That's why we all call it dip neck because it's way too much of a, uh, of a mouthful. Yeah. yeah. So um, there are certain clinical features of dip neck. Um, there are certain pathologic features uh, of dip neck, and there are also certain radiographic uh, features. So if we look at patients who have um, dip neck, what are we seeing under the microscope? So generally what um, really gives it away is we see evidence of neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, meaning neuroendocrine cell overgrowth mm -hmm. within 
airways known as bronchial. So the pathologist will actually look under the microscope and they'll see those overgrowths kind of taking over the airways. So that is one part of the spectrum of what's seen under the microscope. What is also seen is that there are sort of these very small tumors called tumorlets. Um, they are invasive in nature, but they're very small. Mm -hmm. um, so five uh, millimeters or less. So we'll see evidence of neuroendocrine overgrowth. We'll see these tiny uh, tumors. And then uh, we can also see carcinoid uh, tumors as part of this spectrum. So that's under the microscope. So what do we see on imaging? So on imaging, we often see tiny uh, lung nodules sort of in both lungs. And we can also see evidence that maybe there's some air tracking, all right? Because we have all these neuroendocrine cells that are overgrowing in the small airways. So you can actually see findings of air trapping. So they call it like mosaic attenuation. So there's some imaging findings that also uh, give it away. From a clinical standpoint, when I've seen patients in my clinic, they will have said, I have had symptoms for multiple years, even decades uh, before this diagnosis has been found. It tends to be a very slow growing uh, process, although though there are outlying cases where the clinical symptoms may worsen more quickly, but most patients will have either very stable shortness of breath or cough for multiple years or a decade or, or more, or just a slow progression of those uh, clinical symptoms. So um, I will say that it is often mistaken before a patient is diagnosed with asthma or COPD. And sometimes when they're doing those pulmonary function tests to measure the air volumes and how um, good the lungs are exchanging air, it will actually show that there is obstruction within the airway. That is a possibility. So it's, it's uh, frequently initially diagnosed as an asthma or CPD, which is of course much more common mm -hmm. uh, before a patient eventually gets uh, a diagnosis of DIPNEC. Now, if there's um, involvement of uh, lymph nodes, um, Joy, as, as I understand you had mentioned, you know, as part of the DIPMEX spectrum, patients can develop invasive uh, carcinoid tumors. And of course, uh, a carcinoid tumor has the ability to metastasize. So I suspect that along the spectrum of DIPNEC, there, there must have been a, also a carcinoid a tumor, which has the ability to um, metastasize to lymph nodes and, and other uh, regions. So uh, that's a great question. I'm always... Um, delighted to highlight DIPNEC because it's uh, frequently not uh, recognized and it is relatively uncommon, although I can say I've seen quite a number of cases. I think once you have the awareness, you tend to see these things more. Absolutely. Folks, uh, this is Lunch with the Experts with today's guest, Dr. Sukumani Pada. And I just wanted to, to remind you all that this video will live on uh, Evergreen on the Videos tab, also on the YouTube channel starting Monday. But also we have, you know, I mentioned this earlier in the program, we have so many videos over the 10 years that I've been working with CCF <laughs> that you can use. And one of them, which came out, what year is it now? Last year was lung nets and dip neck. So we have somewhere, whatever you are faced with, I guarantee you, almost guarantee you, uh, I feel very confident that we have a video for that. We've definitely hosted uh, someone on the show, but we also have produced videos where we dive a little little bit deeper into those. So we specifically have one. You also We also have playlist in the videos tab, so you don't have to just scrub through hundreds of videos. You can go to the playlist of the 2020 um, CCF video series update. And we have one specifically about lung nets and dip neck. That question does come up a lot. So uh, yeah, check it out and check out some of the other videos that we have at your disposal. So a couple of questions about necrosis that have come up. Kate says, does the presence of necrosis impact prognosis or not? Yeah, Kate, that's a good question. So I think it, it, it does because of its association with what kind of lung neurodegenerative tumor it is. So as um, the uh, 
patients who have these high grade or more aggressive lung neuroendocrine tumors, small cell lung cancer, or large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, oftentimes you see extensive necrosis. And that in general, those tumors can be very aggressive, meaning how quickly they're growing, how quickly they're uh, replicating. Um, as an example, uh, for patients who have small cell lung cancer, we know that it grows very quickly, uh, but because it also grows very quickly, it tends to respond very quickly to uh, things like uh, chemotherapy. Um, but it is a, it's a difficult disease to treat because of the resistance to, to treatments. So I would say uh, necrosis is associated with this kind of biology. So definitely is associated with prognosis. Um, for a typical and atypical carcinoid, obviously they sit much closer together in terms of how, how they behave, how, what their prognosis is like, but there are still some, some differences in prognosis between typical and atypical carcinoids. So remember for typical carcinoid, um, you won't see any evidence of necrosis. That's uh, part of the definition, absence of necrosis. But for atypical carcinoid, you may see focal areas. It's not usually super extensive the way it would be for small cell or, or large cells. And um, because of its association with the overall broader category, um, there is implications for uh, prognosis, yes. Got it, got it. What's the next Okay, another dip neck question from Joy. Who is sequencing dip neck from our DNA? There isn't a common thread. This is a great question, Joy. Yeah, I I've been smile. thinking <laughs> about this. Uh, I've been thinking about this too because um, <clears throat> one of my questions is, uh, you know, are these all arising sort of independently of each other, or? Is there some sort of sequence over time where one gets rise to the other that gets rise to the other? So there have been uh, studies like that, even in uh, lung cancer, where they or or other cancers too, where they look at sort of the most uh, genomically the least invasive lesion and and track it over time and see. Um, these are basic scientists, so they're using all these fancy molecular sequencing and bioinformatics analysis to see um, what are the molecular events or genomic abnormalities that may contribute to progression. So that's one of my questions too, you know, is um, each proliferation tumor let carcinoid in a, a patient with deaf neck sort of arising independently or did one give rise to the next, give rise to the next? Um, so I think this is a question of um, interest. I can say that uh, from a technical challenge of doing this kind of analysis is right. These are tiny, tiny samples and still our uh, sequencing technology requires some amount of adequate tissue to do due diligence to see what's, if there's abnormalities within the DNA. So I will say the proliferations are really hard to kind of dissect on their own to see exactly what is going on within this proliferation. Um, for tumorlets, it's a little bit, a uh, little bit easier. For carcinoids, um, easier. So that's been, I think, that's one of the challenges of an analysis like that. Uh, for you know, for invasive uh, lung carcinoid tumors, um, there have been a sequencing analysis that have been performed. Uh, from a treatment standpoint, we often ask, you know, is the abnormality that was found, is it something that we can action on? I mean, do, do we have a, a therapy that matches with that abnormality that would be a good treatment option? In general, for patients with lung carcinoid tumors, we don't see that, um, like an abnormality that we can action on. But I always say, you know, what we can action on today is different than what we're gonna be able to action on in the future. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I also you know, treat patients with lung cancer and within uh, the category of non-small cell lung cancer, there are now nine genomic targets with associated therapies. And two of those are just within the last year. So last year I would have said, oh, wait, we can't action on that. But this year I can say, oh yeah, we can action on that. So 
you know, with, um, with discovery and also uh, not only from a basic science perspective, but also from a translational therapeutic perspective, uh, uh, things, things change over time. So um, I really appreciate that question. Thanks, Joy. Absolutely. And um, forgive me if you did cover this, but we have a follow-up question from Pat who says, what, tre- what treatments are recommended for dip neck? I know you had. Oh, goodness. Okay. Yeah, Pat, that's a, that's a great question. Talk about, you know, in general for patients with lung nerve tumors, we don't have as much data to support our management and, and treatment decisions. Like for patients who have um, uh, lung nuts that, were, that are not amenable to a complete resection, uh, the only approved therapy within the US is uh, this uh, pill therapy mTOR inhibitor Everlimus or Affinitor is the uh, manufacturer's name. So um, for dip neck, it's even, it's even less uh, data. So there have been some, uh, there have been some single institution studies where they look at different, um, different therapeutics. The most common one that's been studied is somatostatin analogs. So octreotide um, or lanreotide. And in uh, those groups of uh, patients, when it's been reported, the patients do report some improvement in their symptoms, such as cough or shortness of breath may get better. Um, And even in some studies where they've done uh, pulmonary function tests, the absolute values of uh, the degree of obstruction can lessen. Um, from my time at Stanford uh, University, I was working with uh, one of our uh, oncology fellows, uh, Dr. Thomas Sun, who's also very interested in, in caring for patients with uh, neuroendocrine tumors, including neuroendocrine tumors in lung. He's uh, curated um, a, a data set of, of patients with dip neck in our institution, and we're working on uh, getting that out so to be published so all of you can uh, read it. But I- I- even in our uh, cohort analyses, we were able to uh, see benefit with somatostatin analogs. There's less data, I would say, with um, like Everlimus, although that's been tried for patients who have very aggressive dip neck, which is usually an outlier, meaning um, their pulmonary function is deteriorating very quickly. Their clinical symptoms, performance status are deteriorating very quickly. Uh, there are reports of even lung transplant, but that is uh, definitely uh, an outlier. So a, a great, great question. Uh, we definitely need more uh, data in how to manage patients with dip neck. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Pat, for your question. Good to see you again, or see your name at least. I miss seeing your face. Uh, from Lori, my mother died at 95 from nets in the lung. Sorry to hear that, Lori. Uh, and I also have lung nets. My MEN1 test came back negative. Any any thoughts, any things that, that she should consider? Yeah, Lori, first of all, I'm sorry to hear about your mom. Um, and uh, now that you're also going through a diagnosis of lung net, I mean, MEN1 is uh, one of the s- syndromes we know about, right? But uh, like, like everything, I think with uh, what is and what isn't inherited, not just with uh, lung neuroendocrine tumors, but generally within uh, oncology, there's still a lot to, a lot to learn. Um, so that's what we know to look for right now. And um, obviously the geneticists, they send uh, uh, a broader gene panel just to check for uh, other possible inherited um, syndromes. They generally do that, uh, just even if it's not directly associated with uh, a lung neuroendocrine tumor to rule out what we know. But there may be some things we we don't know, and it also may um, may may be by chance. It's it's just hard to know whether it's something we haven't uncovered yet or. Um, this may be by chance, but um, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry to hear about your mom. All right. Thanks, Lori. Sending you love. Uh, moving on, folks, we have just about 10 minutes. We're going to keep pushing forward with some questions. Uh, Lisa, with regards to lung carcinoids, I had a resection on the right side and cannot resect the tumor in the left lung. And I also have dip neck, so the protocol is to have more scans like every four months as opposed to once a year. Is it typical to watch people who have dip neck? 
Yeah, Lisa, that's a that's a great question. So yes, um, much of our strategy for patients with DIPNAP because it tends to be, um, it can be stable over many years depending on uh, the particular case and other uh, cases. It can be very slowly growing. It's it's generally an outlier for uh, things to. Uh, progress uh, quickly. Um, so that is generally the, the, the pillar of um, what we're doing in terms of management is surveillance and also seeing our patients to ensure they're not experiencing any worsening symptoms such as cough or shortness of breath, those things we really uh, pay close attention to. So as I had mentioned earlier, dip, dip neck is often um, found in, uh, it, it's, it's a multifocal um, a disease, meaning it's often found in both lungs. So um, I'm not surprised to hear that there was disease seen in the right lung, but also the uh, left lung. And of course, um, when we're thinking about our treatment management strategies, uh, we are also thinking about what is the best way to protect your lungs, uh, lung uh, sparing uh, treatments, uh, sometimes uh, we will go for the uh, dominant lesion because stiff neck is also, also associated with uh, carcinoid tumors. So oftentimes if a patient has a new diagnosis, uh, that uh, tumor, that dominant tumor may be resected and these other tiny uh, bilateral uh, nodules may be uh, surveyed over time. And um, it's a scenario where, you know, if, if one lesion starts to act more aggressively, uh, we tend to want to biopsy that uh, just to uh, confirm uh, because there are generally so many nodules, we want to confirm that it is a carcinoid and uh, we can um, offer more local treatment with that. So obviously you can only do so many surgeries. We have Two, two lungs that are non-renewable. Non so we wanna be very mindful of that. There is um, another technology known as stereotactic radiation. And we use stereotactic radiation um, uh, for patients who have lung cancer, particularly if you know, they're not felt to be able to tolerate uh, surgery has very good for early stage lung cancer, has very good local control and also uh, survival for these patients. Uh, so it's a very good treatment, uh, particularly for patients who, who can't undergo surgery or have already had a surgery and really can't undergo another surgery. Um, but we don't know for, for how effective these, uh, this uh, therapy is, this stereotactic radiation is for, for lung carcinoid tumors. But we do um, definitely discuss it within the thoracic tumor board. If you know we are worried about a lesion, but I think surgery is probably not a good option. And I've had patients who had stereotactic radiation like years prior, mm -hmm. uh, where there's still evidence of um, local control uh, within that tumor. So even though we don't have as much data, we kind of extrapolate from what we do know in, in lung cancer. Uh, so that's another option we can we can go to, but without really uh, as much as we can a multidisciplinary discussion to see what's best. Yeah, yeah, understood. Next question from Jesse and seemingly many other people: What is the difference between a lesion and a tumor? Yeah, Jesse, that's a good question. I feel like as uh, in medicine, we just throw away around all these terms, kind of interchangeably and assume that everyone's following along, even though I know it is, it is confusing. So I think of a lesion as a, some abnormality that we're seeing on imaging, um, whether it's, um, you know, within the lung or the liver or the bone, uh, irrespective of the location. We um, tend to call it a tumor when we know that that's what it is, uh, because you know there are many um, lesions that may be uh, non-cancerous. You know, if it's a little area of inflammation, or um, there are other benign um, conditions that can result in lesions within the lung. So I tend to actually I don't know what I tend to do. I might be just using it interchangeably, but lesion is. Um, a finding on, on imaging tumors generally 
uh, when we know it from a pathologic uh, confirmation. Got it, got it. That makes sense to me. Um, also from Jesse, what if the tumor is located where it cannot be biopsied? Oh, this is, this is tough. Yeah, if a tumor mm -hmm. cannot be biopsied. So um, if we have suspicion based on uh, radiographic appearance, there's certain things about carcinoid tumors, where they're located, what they look like that can give us uh, sort of a sense of this is on our list of potential diagnoses. Uh, you could consider, um, there's a big question mark of insurance allows uh, without a confirmed diagnosis is a somatostant receptor PET, such as 68 gallon dotatate PET to see if that lesion does have uptake. Now, the other thing is if, um, that's, not, if that's not possible, and um, let me just talk, I guess, a little bit about the approaches that we consider to, to biopsy these lesions. Okay. So one is um, uh, by uh, bronchoscopy. So uh, generally this is either with our uh, pulmonary doctor or uh, sometimes thoracic surgery uh, where um, literally uh, a scope is put down into the airway um, and they're able to, um, kind of go through the airways. And if the airway leads to that lesion, uh, it can sometimes be biopsied that way. Another way is if there are concerning lymph nodes involved, sometimes that probe can also include an ultrasound probe and they can look around and see if any of the uh, lymph nodes are suspicious for involvement. And then they can also biopsy in that way. So that's uh, what we call a bronchoscopic approach. So we ask about that. The second is with uh, image guided uh, biopsies. So usually they're coming from outside of the body. Uh, so if it's in the lung, um, it's, it's coming through outside the chest. The exact uh, method in which it is accessed depends on the precise location of the lesion. Of course, if a lesion is very central and the needle has to go through a lot of lung to get there, that can be uh, dangerous and result in bleeding and having the lung collapse. Um, so we also ask about that. So when we're assessing all the possibilities of how can we get the, to this in the least non-invasive way. And then sometimes um, if we can't identify a safe non-invasive way to get to the, to the lesion that we're suspicious of on imaging, uh, we do talk to our surgeons and uh, do consider them as surgical biopsies. But that's kind of the the last thing, because we always want to try to do what's least invasive and safest to get the answer. Uh, because until we have a tissue confirmation, we don't know with 100% certainty what we are dealing with. Got it. I think we have time for one more question. And um, let's take Kate. Kate says, what do you, what, which rather are your preferred treatment options for bone mets in the USA for lung neuroendocrine tumor? Yeah, Kate, that's a, that's a good question. So bone mets, you know, I have seen um, a proportion of patients who uh, at the time of a recurrence with lung nerve tumor have bone uh, predominant disease. So even, um, so the first thing I always ask myself, is there any local issues that we need to deal with right now? Meaning, um, is my, is the patient in front of me seeing pain? Um, is the lesion that we're seeing on imaging uh, going to compromise an organ? Is it going to, you know, if it's in the spine, is it, is it touching the spinal cord? Is it causing any uh, neurologic symptoms? Is it in an area where um, a, a patient may be weight-bearing, like the, the leg, where we worry about a potential pathologic fracture? So that's my first, uh, that's my first assessment. And um, generally, you know, we will work, uh, if we're worried about pathologic fracture, we work with our orthopedic surgeon to see, you know, what's best. And we also work with our radiation oncologist. So that's how we deal with that. That's similarly true for any um, disease in the spine that may be um, at risk for causing problems to the spinal cord and therefore neurologic symptoms. So we oftentimes uh, will rely generally on a radiation oncologist, but sometimes our neuro or 
or orthopedic surgeons who may um, deal with uh, uh, the spine. And then of course, for pain, we know that uh, radiation is very helpful in, in palliation of, of pain. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, of course, uh, we have to rely on systemic treatments, being treatments, pill therapy, um, such as everlimus or a combination chemotherapy um, to, to treat these different lesions, because the way that the cancer has, has traveled to the bone is through the bloodstream. So we want a medication that's absorbed into the bloodstream and is going to all those places to, to control cancer within those locations, and also prevent a new disease. And finally, um, in order to prevent pathologic fracture um, of existing bone lesions, even if they're not causing a problem right at this moment in time, there are different agents called rank ligand inhibitors or, or bisphosphonates that can help strengthen the bone uh, in conjunction with calcium vitamin D. So, you know, we don't know how frequently we have to give um, someone with a lung carcinoid these agents. It's probably less frequently than we have to give for lung cancer, where we're sometimes giving it once a month. That's probably uh, not as frequently as we need it to give it uh, lung uh, carcinoid uh, tumors. So um, that's kind of my strategy in terms of assessing with uh, a patient with bone predominant disease. Got it. Thank you for that, folks. I think that is our show for today, but I wanted to read one comment from our friend John that says, many good questions today. Great reading comments of the other people affected with this disease. There are so many variables. Indeed. Great having these great guests. And in our area, it's hard to get answers. So you guys are our information board. John, that's precisely why we bring you the show for that interactive one-on-one -on -one session. And because sometimes it is hard to get information for this disease. So thank you for being here, my friend. And we will continue to bring you the show to do just that. Dr. Pada, thank you for your time. I appreciate awesome. you. Being thanks, for, thanks for having me and thanks for everyone's time. Absolutely. And thank you all at home. Again, as always, we hope this program helped answer some of your questions. I saw a note from Tina and Rebecca that they joined late. So to Tina and Rebecca and everyone else, just remember you can replay this video at any time. It will live right here on the page and starting Monday on YouTube for non-Facebook users. And if you have any further questions, reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, either at carcinoid.org or right here on Facebook. Send them a message and they will get you that information. Thanks again, as always, to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. We could not create this program without their support. Finally, I am Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching. And please join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye.